Hi, uh, I'm Dan Rockmore, director of the William H. Newcomb Institute for Computational Science here at Dartmouth College, and on behalf of the college and the institute, I'd like to welcome you to this year's Spring Collo Donahoe Colloquium, Hackers and Geniuses, from the noted author and technology writer Stephen Levy. The Donahoe Colloquium is an ongoing series of public lectures aimed at increasing awareness of the many important and sometimes surprising places in which computational ideas are shaping our lives. These events are made possible by a generous gift from David Mickey and Dan Donahoe in honor of Dan's graduation as a member of the class of 2006. It is a central piece of the larger mission of the Newcomb Institute, whose aim is to support and integrate computational thinking and computational ideas throughout the Dartmouth community. The Institute is made possible through the generosity of Bill Newcomb, Dartmouth class of 64 and former trustee of the college. The advent and pervasiveness of computing has made the current era something of a computational age, one in which we have a digital or cyber world that mirrors and ever increasingly displaces our physical one, a place where we are both agents and objects, where we play and are played with. For all the freedoms we may seem to have in the digital world, it is, at the end of the day, one that comes with its own constraints and boundaries, some physical and mathematical, but others that are human-made, constraints and even biases that come from the people who have created this new world, whole cloth, out of, out of bits, bytes, and mathematical theorems. We better understand the real world when we know more about the historical figures who have shaped it. Also, do we better understand the digital world when we learn of its past, present, and even future pioneers? This evening's speaker, the author Stephen Levy, is one of the preeminent writers exploring the personalities and projects that have helped to create our digital landscape. He's been described by the Washington Post as, quote, America's premier technology journalist, a Silicon Valley insider who writes for the rest of us on the outside. Stephen is the former senior staff writer for Wired, the former chief technology correspondent for Newsweek, and currently the editor-in-chief of Back Channel, the new hub for tech writing on the online venue medium.com. His first book, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution, recently updated for a 25th anniversary edition, is a computer history classic and was named by the readers of PC Magazine as the best sci-tech book of, of the last 20 years. His book, Crypto, documented the revolution in public key cryptography and the crypto wars of the 1990s and was the winner of the Frankfurt E Book Award. A longtime expert on Apple, Stephen has written the history of the Macintosh, Insanely Great, and The Perfect Thing About the iPod. His most recent book, In the Plex, How Google Thinks, Works, and Shapes Our Lives, has been a New York Times bestseller and has been called the definitive word on the search giant. It was chosen by Amazon.com as the best business book of 2011. Please join me in welcoming for our 2015 Spring Donahoe Colloquium, Stephen Levy. Well, thanks, Dan, for that uh, warm introduction. And thank you all for, for coming. Uh, I'm really honored to be speaking here in this series. Uh, honored to be at the Newcomb Center. I remember many uh, happy conversations with Bill Newcomb about antitrust in the 1990s. And I'm especially happy to be here at Dartmouth, the fabled birthplace of BASIC. Uh, John Kemeny and the team that devised a straightforward, effective computer language might find it ironic today that over 50 years later, a movement is finally rising to teach coding to everyone as a basic skill, uh, no pun intended. We live in a different world now than Kemeny, Kurtz, and their team did, and the ascendant figure in this world is the hacker. There's one right there, the you know, canonical hacker Bill Gosper from MIT. Around the time BASIC was first being conceived, uh, way under the radar, a hacker culture was being formed. The hackers then seemed like the ultimate outsider movement, almost solipsistic in their isolation and intensity. But now the hacker is both a boogeyman and a role model. Nonetheless, I believe the mindset of hacking now permeates our society. Now, to some of you, uh, those days might seem really ancient, but considering how pervasive computers are, their emergence is almost shockingly recent, within a memory span of many millions. For those of us that old, 
uh, you know, it's almost like remembering the beginnings of fire itself. <laughs> so, so I say us because I was born in the 1950s, less than a decade after the invention of the first computer as we know it. As I grew up, so was the digital revolution taking shape. And you can make an argument that this revolution is not only the most important thing going on in our time, but one of the most important developments in humanity itself. It could change humanity itself. Some people think it could replace humanity itself. So when I was in high school and in college, this epic transformation was just getting started. So what were my own dreams, I wanted, what I wanted to do, living on the edge of this seismic shift? I wanted to be a rock critic. It was the 1960s. The most interesting thing happening, as far as I was concerned, was not happening in windowless computer rooms. It was happening on the stages of rock palaces, on long playing albums, and at rock festivals. And in fact, there I am at the Isle of Wight. Uh, I thought the people who made songs we loved then, Bob Dylan, Jimi Hendrix, The Beatles, Brian Wilson, were not just making music, but they were enabling and accelerating a change in civilization. And I was captivated by the writings of those people who made sense of it. The early rock critics were poets who sang of poets. So I read these people when I was in high school and then college and then graduate school. And I was particularly addicted to Rolling Stone magazine. It was my Bible. And I dreamed of writing for it one day. And when it came time to actually make a living, I gravitated to journalism. So of course, I began writing about rock music. So it was 1975. Um, so back, but I, you know what? The time was passed to make an impact as a rock critic. The music was still great. It was no longer the source of important lessons. In terms of cultural transformation, the music had done its job. The great essays had been written about it. There was not much more to say. So I stopped writing about music, and I got a job writing about all sorts of things, crime, and politics, and sports. What I didn't know was just around at that time, it's now the late 1970s, the actual revolution, the one with computers, was just beginning to take off, and it was a lot bigger than music. The digital revolution was beginning to change the world with computer code, with microprocessors, with the internet. So that's what I eventually wound up writing about. Somewhat belatedly, I admit, but I've been doing it for more than 30 years, so I hope it counts for something at least. Incidentally, in all my extended ignorance about computers, there was one personal connection that I was unaware of. When I was starting out as a writer, I lived in a one-bedroom apartment in the Germantown section of Philadelphia. And every one month, I'd write my check to the landlord, the owner of the building. Now, he had a really strange name, a, a, an earworm of a name, J. Presper Eckert. And uh, it wasn't until years later that I realized that I was writing my rent check to a guy who was arguably the inventor of the computer. That's right. In the early 1940s, as part of the war effort, a project in Philadelphia's Moore School was creating the first programmable electronic calculating machine. And the co-inventor of this thing called the ENIAC, and the guy in charge of the technology, he was kind of the Wozniak of this project, was a local guy, J. Presper Eckert. Now, there's a lot of argument about what the first real computer is. But if you dig into it, and I have a little, I think that ENIAC wins the prize. And that guy was my landlord. So here is the letter that the inventor of the computer sent me telling me that my security deposit didn't quite cover all I owed him when I moved out. Now, as you see, uh, ENIAC did not have a spell checker. So I, what I really want to talk to you about this evening are a few stories with a common thread, stories that spring from my observations of, the world over th of this world over three decades. And the thread begins with something I came across very early in my explorations in this field, and that's the one about hackers. As I indicated before, I really believe they're the key figures of our age. So let me tell you how I first came across them. It involves how I stumbled upon technology in the first place. It came from an assignment I got way back in 1981 when an editor asked me to write about a strange subculture called hackers. By the way, the story I wrote, or my book that came later, was never made into film, so I am in no way responsible for the movie called Hackers, even though I greatly admire the breakout performance of Angelina Jolie in that movie. So what did I know about hackers then? Nothing. Like most people in the world back then, I'd never even touched a computer. And there was almost nothing written about hackers. So maybe now I should say something about the word itself. In this talk, 
I'm not using the word hackers to refer to people who break into banks or cause cyber attacks to steal things or screw things up or punch a time clock for some Asian government to then read Obama's email or redirect internet traffic to a different continent. No, I'm talking about the, the early hackers, the ones I'm talking about here, who were honorable. And they didn't destroy things, they built things. The word only later took on its unfortunate meaning. But back then, there wasn't a problem with the word hacker because just about no one knew it. The only article I found in trying to do research about hackers back then was a story in the magazine Psychology Today. It was a cover story, actually, called The Hacker Papers. It was edited by a professor at Stanford named Philip Zimbardo, and what he did was edit an email conversation among some Stanford geeks that presented hacking as some sort of deep, unhealthy abyss that students were being sucked into. And here's what Zimbardo says. Fascination with the computer becomes an addiction. And as with most addictions, the substance that gets abused is human relationships. So, in the first description to the general public, a hacker is supposedly an antisocial nerd, by and large a loser who's addicted to computers, a booger stain curiosity. I mean, Angelina Jolie shouldn't portray a hacker, she should adopt one. So I figured, cool, I'll go to Stanford and I'll write about these weirdos. But before I left, I asked a colleague who knew a little about Silicon Valley to give me some other folks to talk to. And he provided me a list of names of some people in the burgeoning uh, PC industry, as well as some general wizards you know, uh, uh, in programming. So what I found blew away the stereotype. The people I met in California, at Stanford, in the PC world, by and large, were not antisocial nerds, but creative adventurers of the mind, whose thought processes were utterly fascinating. I found myself learning things from the way they looked at the world. Plus, by and large, they were not depressed, but most were absolutely joyful, flushed with excitement about what they were doing. They felt empowered by programming. What's more, by pushing the envelope on computers, they were just beginning, which was just beginning then to find their way on desktops, they were definitely onto something. Basically, all of us were going to be transformed positively by computers, and these people were among the first to realize it. So I wrote my story for Rolling Stone. Not long afterwards, I was asked to do a book on hackers. And of course, the sales force of my publisher, Doubleday, really fought the idea that the book would be called Hackers because they said no one would ever know what that name was, and no one would ever buy the book. And of course, like most people, they'd never heard the word before. Fortunately, I won that battle. Hackers was my first book. I wanted to be ambitious, so I set out to construct a sweeping narrative. It was going to be about how this rebel movement became the heart of a computer revolution. So I thought I'd open the book with the story of the Homebrew Computer Club. Now this is the group of engineers and chip enthusiasts in Silicon Valley who first met in a garage, where else, in uh, March 1975. And they're galvanized by the appearance of the very first personal computer the Altair 8800, which came in a kit that you had to build yourself. From homebrew sprung the PC industry as we know it. The people at that first meeting included Steve Wozniak, who designed the Apple I to impress his friends there. But well into the researching the process, I came to understand that really the story should not begin in 1975 at homebrew. As it turned out, there was a, a much earlier source of hackers years before that. And it all began, really, at MIT, at the Tech Model Railroad Club, which as members referred to as Tmerk. Hackerism was born there. It's like the Rift Valley of hacking. In fact, these were the first people to use the term in anything like the sense we know it now. They first used the word hackers to describe the members of the club who weren't so much interested in the locomotives and paper mache mountains on top of the layout you see there, but all the switches and cables and gears underneath the train layout. They tinker with it endlessly. So where did that word come from? How do they start using that word to describe themselves, you know, working on a train layout? I looked into it, it was partly because they hacked away at the system. And partly because at MIT, students would often pull elaborate stunts, like uh, get, finding a car and getting it on top of the, the big dome on Massachusetts Avenue. And at MIT, those pranks were called hacks. So in the spring of 1959, the first course ever available to underclassmen in computer programming was offered at MIT. And the Tamerk hackers filled the classroom. And that was the moment 
when people who called themselves hackers first used the computer. A few months later, a new computer arrived at MIT. It was called the TX0. And the hackers were asked to write some of the software for it, like debugging programs and compilers. More important, they had direct access to the machine and could program it interactively, like we do now with our computers and workstations. Previously, people had to submit punch cards to attendants and you know, uh, then wait days sometimes to get printouts of their programs. Remember, this is before time sharing, before BASIC. The hackers immediately spent all their time with the TX0. They hardly ever left the room. They worked late into the night, early in the morning, and made it their mission to learn more. Now, two interesting things happened from that. First, the hackers set a course that still dominates in the computer world today. It's based on openness and collaboration. Now, with the TX0, the programs were stored on paper tapes. The tapes would go into a drawer, and anyone was free to open the drawer, take out a tape, load the program into the machine, and then check out the code. At that point, they may, may be able to write a new feature or debug the code or improve the program in some other way, and then they'd cut a new tape and put the tape back in the drawer. There was no idea of owning the code. It was for anyone to use. There was no talk of patents or copyright. It belonged to everybody. Now, today we talk about open source and open APIs, and we appreciate what they do for the community at large. And if you look at almost all the successful products today, they're built on the shoulders of systems that allow access to a common system, most often interoperability with other programs and apps. And here's where it happened first. That's the hacker legacy. A second thing happened from that. Computers were very expensive then. Every second of computer time was thought to be precious. But the hackers saw the computer as part of their everyday lives. They were always trying to do what you can't do on a computer. And now those so-called impossible tasks are the things that provide the benefits when most of us use computers. It was those to Merck hackers who did things like the very first text processor. Since the TX0 cost a million dollars, they called it expensive typewriter. They invented word processing. Another student did his math homework on the computer. His program was a precursor to spreadsheets, which of course we use to model all businesses now. But when he handed his homework into the teacher, the teacher gave him an F. He said, you can't do this on a computer. About a year after the TX0, a brand new company called the Digital Equipment Corporation asked the hackers to help program the first mini computer, the PDP-1. And among the hacks the MIT people created was a game called Space War. Again, a collaborative enterprise with the participation of multiple programmers incubated in the spirit of sharing. It was the first interactive video game. A few years later, when the Defense Department helped start the internet, it turned to people who operated on the same wavelength as hackers, and some hackers themselves. These people understood that open protocols would force collaboration, get more done, and make the system more reliable and robust. The internet is built on hacker principles. Basically, nearly all the things that masses of people do with computers now were things invented by the hackers. Now, these hackers did it because they wanted these tools for themselves. There was also something very satisfying in doing what people told them couldn't or shouldn't be done with computers. Which leads me to lessons that people are more consciously drawing from hackers today. In the past few years, a fascinating phenomenon has occurred. Even as dark side hackers are presenting a bigger threat than ever to our systems, the original positive word is having a comeback. You know, even just today I learned that even at Dartmouth, um, there's a hacker club there. Maybe at one time they wouldn't have called their club a hacker club. In Silicon Valley, you see the word hacker used all the time. If you want to create some sort of viral app, you tap hackers. If you're an angel investor and you want to you know, uh, you know, find a great company, you, you know, find founders who are hackers. And even big companies are embracing the term. The prime example is Facebook. In his letter to shareholders in the 2012 uh, IPO of Facebook, CEO Mark Zuckerberg said he runs his company by what he calls the hacker way. Zuckerberg says that hacking at Facebook is designed to quickly generate code that can be put to use immediately, even if it breaks things, he says. In fact, if you go to Facebook today, you'd almost think the company was called Hacker and not Facebook. 
If you go on the campus, on every wall there's a poster saying hack or hackathon. And on one of the buildings, there's a giant sign saying the hacker company. And of course, Facebook's address in Menlo Park is one hacker way. <laughs> True. In any case, once I discovered the hackers, I was hooked. Then that led me to Apple Computer and Steve Jobs, which is the second story I'm going to tell tonight. Now, it's important to remember that Apple emerged from the hacker ethic. As I said, Steve Wozniak came from the Homebrew Computer Club. He built the first Apple to please himself and impress his friends. But it was his partner, Steve Jobs, who eventually became almost synonymous with Apple. Everyone knows the story. He co-founded the company, and in 1985, he was fired, cast out into the wilderness, only to come back 12 years later to leave Apple, to lead Apple to unprecedented glory. It's now the most valuable company on earth, and no one disputes that Steve Jobs was the engine of that success. So what did he do? What were the secrets behind Steve Jobs' strategy for success? Now, I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time with him over the years. But the very first time was just before Apple was about to release its groundbreaking new computer, the Macintosh. I convinced, of course, Rolling Stone magazine to let me write a story about it. Now, that was pretty unusual in 1983 for Rolling Stone. They didn't often write stories about computer companies. And I thought Apple would be thrilled when I told them I got an assignment from Rolling Stone to do the story about this computer they were going to unroll. So I was sort of surprised when I came back. And they said, well, I don't know if this is going to work out. Steve Jobs says that he would only uh, agree to let you do the story if he were on the cover of Rolling Stone. <laughs> <clears throat> well, that wasn't going to happen. In 1983, the only people who were on the cover of Rolling Stone were rock stars and movie stars. And a computer guy did not qualify for that. Fortunately, Steve backed down, and I got to do the story. So uh, I saw, do, reporting that, for the first time, what I came to see over a number of years, which is how Steve Jobs and Apple you know, pursued a, a success and built products there. And the first thing they had, they had going for them is a belief that all products should be designed as if the designer were the user. And as we've seen, you know, starting from Tamerk, this is kind of a classic hacker trait. The Macintosh team thought of the Macintosh as sort of like a stereo system with superpowers, something they absolutely wanted for themselves and to bring home for, them, for themselves and use. But there was a second twist that was all Steve Jobs. Now, Steve was young and inexperienced and entering an industry where computers were typically ugly boxes. But somehow, Jobs had the fortitude and confidence to say that everyone else was wrong that the exponential changes in computing power would drive these esoteric devices into the mainstream, and design would become important. He wanted beautiful products that would delight the users. Of course, we think now of Apple products as synonymous with that trait. Of course, they're delightful and beautiful. That's what Apple does. That's what they're still trying to do with this thing on my watch that doesn't always come on when I twist my, hand, my, my wrist. But back in 1983, no one thought that beauty and delight was important or even relevant to computing. So where did this view of products come from? Jobs' mindset was forged in the 60s. He wasn't kidding when at one point he said that one of the most important experiences in his life was taking LSD. His experiences and experiments and the stuff he you know, gathered from you know, all kinds of places. He tells a famous story about learning calligraphy in a class that he monitored at, at Reed after he dropped out. All of this stuff stretched his mind beyond the conventions of geekdom to a broader aesthetic. What's more, he was unafraid to pitch this vision even when it seemed preposterous. Now, I heard some of this directly from Steve's mouth the first time I interviewed him. And it was the very first day I saw the Macintosh. I came in, you know, doing that story for Rolling Stone. The moment I laid eyes on that machine, I knew that my life with computing, maybe my whole life, was going to be different. What's more, I thought that everyone's life with computing, and maybe their lives were going to be different too, because this style of computing was going to catch on. And I had a fantastic day. I met all these people on the Mac team, and some of them actually became good friends of mine, were friends to this day. But at the end of the day was my big meeting with Steve Jobs. We were going to go out to dinner together. And we did, and we talked about many things, but one of them was about the Mac's design philosophy. One particular comment he shared with me was like a skeleton key that opened up his views on design and product creation in particular. And that key still operated over 25 years later as Steve went on to lead teams that would create the iPod, the iPhone, and the iPad. So 
When I asked him about this, about design and creation, he invoked the image that was on Apple's first brochure. It was, of an, it was an apple there. And this is what he said, and I'm going to read you um, something that I picked up from the transcript of that interview that I did in November 1983. This is Steve talking. Fruit and apple. That simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. When you start looking at a problem, it seems really simple because you, really, you don't really understand the complexity of the problem, and your solutions are way too oversimplified, and they don't work. And then you get into the problem, and you see it's really complicated, and you come up with all these convoluted solutions. That's where most people stop, and the solutions tend to work for a while. But the really great person will keep going and find the key underlying principle of the problem, and sort of come full circle with a beautiful, elegant solution that works. And that's what we wanted to do with Mac. So when you unpack this passage, it's kind of remarkable. His view of computers was really a statement about identity. What kind of people are we? You know, jobs couldn't stand ugliness, so his computer had to reflect that. It not only had to work better, it had to be, in his words, beautiful and elegant. Now, if you read Walter Isaacson's biography about Jobs, or my own book about the Macintosh, or the more recent book, Becoming Steve Jobs, by Brent Schlender and Rick Tadzelli, you know about Steve's harsh management style. Maybe that's even an understatement. He accepted nothing less than the very best work from his people. And his teams would work their hearts out, and they would produce something that they felt was fantastic. And Steve would glance at what they'd done, and then dismiss it with a word that I'm not going to repeat here, but it's not a word that you'd want applied to your work. In short, he set what seemed like an impossibly high standard. But in doing so, he got people to produce things that had previously seemed impossible. Now, it's really hard to enforce high standards. But if you want to make a dent in the universe, and that's a term Steve often used, pulling off the impossible is a pretty good strategy. Steve knew something that all too few of his competitors realize. We've been trained to perceive a world locked in physical boundaries, but those don't exist in the digital world. Only imagination and courage limits you, or one other thing can limit you, a boss who accepts work that's just good enough. That's why the people who once worked for Steve now look back and marvel about how he made them produce something better than they could even imagine. Jobs drove them hard, and there were times that they cursed the ground he walked on. He could make life hell for them. But I know a lot of people on the Macintosh team, and every one of them will say to this day that those were the best days of their lives. Those people were great hackers, by the way. So finally, a third story. I want to talk about Google, which is probably the most important company of the Internet age. It's a company also full of hackers, to be sure. So what made Google so successful? That's something I've had a lot of opportunity to ponder. Since I began covering Google very early in its history, I did the first news magazine cover story about Google. And I always thought it would be really great to write a book about Google, but in 2004, the year they went public, I was busy writing a book about the iPod, and two other books about Google appeared, both of them pretty good. Um, and I felt, well, that, that kind of does it. If I wanted to write a book about Google, it should be really different than those others, but I didn't know how to do that. Then in 2007, Google invited me to accompany some of their young leaders on an international trip. As, as it turns out, a Google executive, Marissa Mayer, uh, you know her now as the CEO of Yahoo, it created a program where the company took the best graduates in computer science, both from undergraduate and graduate programs, and made them into product managers. They gave them lots of responsibility off the bat. And they have a two-year program, and for one year they'd lead one project, and for another second year they'd lead a second project. But in the middle, Marissa would take them on a trip to visit Google offices overseas. And that's what I was invited to cover. So we went from San Francisco to Tokyo to Beijing to Bangalore to Tel Aviv, then across the Atlantic back to the US, literally around the world. So for two weeks, I was totally inside the Google bubble. And I saw things that no previous reporter had ever seen. This really was a different company, I came to realize. So I thought it would be great to do a whole book from this inside perspective. And I pitched the idea, and I, since Google wasn't totally transparent in those days, and as a matter of fact, really uh, didn't like to talk much about their inner workings, I was very surprised and pleased, of course, when the very top executives, Larry, Sergey, and Eric, uh, gave the okay to the project. 
So for two years, I had unprecedented access to the company. So what did I learn about Google? Well, the first thing I wanted to look at, of course, was search, the flagship project of Google. So in the company's early days, Google search was based primarily on kind of a big data approach of capturing the entire web and performing complicated math to extract value from the connections, the links between websites. And the lesson of that is Google learned first that the way to internet success is to take advantage of scale and emergent intelligence. In this case, it was the collective intelligence of the people who made those links. And it goes without saying that this kind of advance and those kinds of results couldn't have been done even five years earlier because of you know, only recently we had this massive connectivity and the, the advanced technology, the web, that had just arrived. But as the web grew, Google had to make its search engine smarter. It wanted to answer more complicated questions and even handle ambiguous queries. So how did it do that? <clears throat> the solution was to turn Google search into a learning machine where the system learns about the worlds humans live in and about the meanings of the queries they give it. So this required Google to get the best talent in AI and machine learning. And of course, those people also have the hacker spirit. Now, even though Google um, in those early days was a small startup with virtually no revenue stream, its leaders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, did an amazing job of actually hiring those people. Once they lured them into an interview, uh, usually held in over a ping pong table in the conference room in their office there, they convinced people to leave academia and research labs. And how did they do it? Because those candidates saw that Larry and Sergey both had a lot of technological know-how, but also the gumption to take on the hardest, most interesting problems. And that's what engineers love. So maybe one of their big breakthroughs occurred in this hiring process when they hired Jeff Dean. <clears throat> Anyone heard of Jeff Dean? Almost no one. Well, Dean, obviously, uh, is not a household name, but within the AI community, he was known as one of the best scientists in the country. In fact, <clears throat> it's kind of an internet meme that tell tall tales about his prowess. So on the internet, there are a few sites that tell what are known as Jeff Dean facts. Let me share a couple with you. Uh, Jeff Dean is still waiting for mathematicians to discover the joke he hid in the digits of pi. <clears throat> Jeff Dean's keyboard has two keys, one and zero. Jeff Dean's watch displays seconds since January 1st, 1970. He is never late. Smart guy. Uh, Jeff had been working at uh, the Digital Equipment Corporation's West Coast Research Lab. And when Google nabbed him, <clears throat> people were stunned. It was like a minor league basketball team hiring LeBron James. People went, Google hired Jeff Dean? And his hiring was kind of like an all clear sign to top computer scientists saying it was OK to join Google. And indeed, <clears throat> Dean has done amazing work for Google, having a major hand in inventing the infrastructure for cloud computing, especially in getting an entire data center of tens and thousands of servers to act as a single entity. So the second thing I looked at at Google was its ad system, which became the engine of its financial success. And what's more, it was almost an equal technological achievement to search. Now, Larry and Sergey hated traditional advertising. Instead, they wanted something that seems impossible, a system where ads were welcome, where the ads would be as valuable to customers as the organic search results. Now, I won't get into the way it works in much detail, but basically, Google Ads, AdWords is the name of the product, is an auction-based system where advertisers pay Google only when customers click on the ads, not when they show them, but when the customers interact with them. But the really innovative part is that the bidding process doesn't assign winners solely on how much the advertisers bid for how much they're going to pay for a click. Instead, Google adjusts those bids so that better ads, the ads that are useful to customers, cost less. This makes the system work for everybody because good ads, ads that help users, are cheaper and thus appear more often. Well, the trick here, of course, is knowing in advance what a good ad is. And the way Google does it is with sophisticated algorithms and AI. And again, you simply couldn't do it without technology that barely just came into existence. Now, earlier, I talked about how Steve Jobs got people to do the impossible. Larry Page, Google's CEO, is perhaps an even bigger advocate of that, of that uh, making people do the impossible. He thinks that thinking big is the key to Google's continued success. In the case of ads, Google knew that their system, which would have been impossible before, could now be done. About a year after my book came out, 
I had another long interview with Larry uh, for Wired magazine, where I was working at the time, and he elaborated on some of those ideas. He said during that interview, something really remarkable, something that stuck with me and made me uh, reevaluate the way I look at companies. He was complaining about the way the media views uh, reports on companies as a competition, like sports or elections. Um, and he, on one hand, he wasn't that bothered with that because that's just the media, and he really doesn't care too much about the media. But he says the bad thing happens when companies themselves start to think that way. Instead of, making better ver instead of trying to make better versions of a rival's products, he thinks that they should just ignore the idea of competition and think way ahead to leapfrog what's currently happening there. The conventional wisdom of companies is to do approximately what you did before. Okay, uh, actually, this is Larry talking now. Um, I want to read something that he said to me during that interview, um, which uh, you know, sort of expressed this. The conventional wisdom of companies is to do approximately what you did before with minor changes. There's a natural tendency to people to want to work on things that aren't going to fail. So they want to do incremental stuff. But that's guaranteed to be a bad plan because there's going to be non-incremental change. A big part of my job, said Larry, is getting people focused on really important things. And a lot of times, those things are not incremental. Now, the example he gave me uh, on this was Gmail and how, when it was introduced, it did something that a lot of people thought was crazy, to offer one and then two gigabytes of free storage to everyone. And that was 200 times what the competitors were offering at the time. Now, I could tell you personally that it was a leap that his competitors did not anticipate. A few months after Gmail came out, Bill Gates came to visit me in my office at Newsweek. The purpose of his visit was to tell me that spam would be eradicated within a year. <laughs> this was 2004, 11 years ago. How did that work out? So after he finished explaining this to me, uh, we were just hanging around my office. It was Bill and me and my editor and talking about what kind of tools we used. And my editor and I uh, told them we both started using Gmail, and we were using it in the way Google suggested, never delete anything, just keep using it. Um, you know, and both of us, each of us really had filled up about half now by then of our two gigabits of storage. Um, gigabyte, gigabytes, I guess, right? I'm checking with Dan here. Um, <clears throat> and Bill just leaped out of his seat and said, how could that possibly be? How could you fill up so much space? In, you know, you know, what are you, storing movies in your email? And he started quizzing us on how many messages we had and started calculating in his head how much Google took to store his message there. And he was missing the point. Basically, Bill could not grasp the concept as using mail as if storage was unlimited. But Google knew that that's essentially what was happening to storage. Now, Bill Gates came of age in a period where storage was at a premium. He crammed his first software product, Altair Basic, hey, thanks, Dartmouth, into four kilobytes not gigabytes, not megabytes, little tiny kilobytes. Today, that's like writing War and Peace on a dust moat. Now, Bill is one of the smartest people on Earth. Intellectually, he knew all about how dramatically cheap storage was becoming. He knew all about Moore's Law, where computation becomes half as expensive and twice as powerful every 18 months. But it hadn't really baked into his mindset. He didn't breathe it when confronted with a system that took advantage of this exponential reality, his first thing to think was to challenge it and say, that's not possible. Now, you can question Larry Page when he says he doesn't obsess about competition. After all, the European Union has concluded that Google is an outright competitive abuser when it comes to search. And certainly, you could see that Google did and does engage in competitive strategy with its Android operating system. But in terms of what Page calls moonshots, super ambitious long-term projects, Google is still attempting the audacious. What would it mean if all companies did that? Now, some people seem to get it. I've also been lucky enough to spend some time with Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. Now, Jeff once told me that Amazon's advantage over competitors is that it often takes on long challenges, sometimes looking at a time frame of seven years or more to bring a product to fruition. He told me, hey, if you take on a project that takes three years to complete, you're, you're going to be competing with a lot of companies. But if you do something audacious, something that requires seven years, you'll only be competing against a fraction of the field because people seldom dare to think that big. 
But of course, big thinking is the only way to accomplish big things. So when Jeff told me this, I thought about his particip participation in the Millennium Clock program. Have any of you heard of this, the Millennium Clock? A couple people. So this was conceived by the great computer scientist, Danny Hillis, who's best known for founding the Thinking Machines Company, the supercomputer uh, that runs in parallel. Now, Danny wanted to challenge the world to think on a very, very long horizon so he can see the giant clock that could keep time for 10,000 years. Now, this is a prototype, but Danny envisioned a giant clock housed in a huge structure. Now, building something like this requires a different way of thinking. Should you build your millennium clock in a very populated area where there's people around to tend to it? Or should you build a more self-sustaining system in a remote area where there won't be people around to mess with it? Each solution requires a different design and forces an examination of what the far future might be like. Amazingly, a group called the Long Now Foundation is actually building a full-scale version of the Millennium Clock in the desert. And Jeff Bezos is funding it because it feeds the same mentality that keeps his company innovative. Now, Bezos told me he likes to talk to people in business about the clock project. And the people who don't get it, he says, aren't the people who are going to change the world. That's a quote from an interview he gave me. But I keep coming back to Larry's point about competition. He says things aren't worth doing unless you're doing something original, something that isn't trying to match your competitors, something risky. And last year, I took those arguments to heart and took a chance on my own career. I left the security of a big media company and joined the internet startup, Medium, where I already get to build something myself. I now lead a tech writing publication I created on the Medium platform called Backchannel. And this has been a fantastic experience and sometimes a jarring one because the startup world moves fast, faster than Condé Nast. And sometimes they break things. So one of the things I wrote uh, more recently for Back Channel was a series on what's new for Google Search with a focus on artificial intelligence. Now I assume you all know about Google's self-driving car, but how many know that Google is building a brain? Just a few. That's right. The Google brain is called, and Google's gathered a, a group of great computer scientists to use its vast data centers for a network tangle of connections, a neural net that use, makes use of tons of information and learning algorithms to make connections on its own. And can you guess who's running the Google Brain? Jeff Dean. <laughs> More Jeff Dean tales are in the works. So this also helps explain why Google hired Ray Kurzweil, who is one of the most dynamic figures in artificial intelligence. Now, I interviewed Ray some time ago, and I had a particular question for him that relates to a story I did much earlier in my career. It was a time uh, after I was writing rent checks to J. Presper Eckert and before I first came across hackers. I was working for a magazine called New Jersey Monthly and my editor gave me a bizarre assignment. I want you to find Einstein's brain, he said. Uh, I said, well, is it missing? <laughs> and the answer, oddly, was yes, it is missing. And I want you to find it. Well, I eventually did find it. It was in two mason jars in Wichita, Kansas. And that's a whole other story which I don't have time to get into here, but I promise you, if you Google it, you will find out all about it. So lead, finding that brain led me to puzzle out a big question. How did Einstein's brain lead to Einstein? What connection was there between that physical matter and who he was? And that question became even more vital to me as I met and got to know some of the people that I've been talking about today. The early hackers, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Stephen Wolfram, another fantastic scientist, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg. These are extraordinary people. And to me, one of the biggest mysteries in life is why all the oozing viscera and brain flop inside them leads to them. So that brings me back to Kurzweil. He had recently written a book about intelligence and had some speculations about Einstein. So I asked him my burning question, what really happens in the brains of special people and makes them so special? And Kurzweil said he had the answer. Wow. So first he says, Einstein was able to be Einstein in part because he focused his brain to do one thing really well. Now Einstein also played the violin, 
But when it came to violin playing, he was no Yasha Heifetz. And Yasha Heifetz knew a little about physics, but he was no Einstein. They were both really exceptional, only in the one thing they focused on. But that argument didn't impress me, because there's a lot of physicists who focus a lot on physics, but there's only one Einstein. That doesn't explain Einstein. But wait, he said, there's more. <coughs> Two other things distinguish such extraordinary people from the rest of us. For starters, he says, those people understand the exponential progress of technology. So Kurzweil says that we've been experiencing a nonlinear growth of technological power, a process that's been going on pre-transistor since about 1890, he dates it, and it shows no sign of abating. So one thing Kurzweil abstracts from this, by the way, from this and some other data, is that we're going to have intelligent and conscious computer systems by the year 2029. That's the year he pegs it, 2029. Put it on your calendar. Anyway, he explained that that trend is an evolutionary disruption because our brains, before all that, have evolved to process things in a linear fashion so we can do straightforward tasks and make logical plans to avoid threats like animals that want to eat us. But only some of us, the special ones, are able to naturally and deeply grasp those exponential changes that characterize our modern world. And those changes, of course, make it possible, inevitable, for crazy things to actually become real. But understanding that is not enough. Those outliers also have to be fearless. Specifically, they have to have the courage to press on with creative ideas that are so big, so outlandish, so crazy that others will mock them. Every one of those special people I've mentioned have had the courage to risk humiliation in executing their vision. So I wonder, is that capacity, even that fearlessness, genetically hardwired in some brains and not others? I don't know, but I don't want to believe that. I'd like to think it's possible to adjust and learn. I'd like to think that by hearing these inspirational stories, we can grasp a new understanding, one that gives us the courage to think up and do crazy things, the non-incremental things that are necessary to succeed in our non-linear world. And this is what the hackers knew. In the Model Railroad Club and many places thereafterwards, those hackers pretty much didn't care what the rest of the world thought. And as Kurzweil would say, as he did say in that interview, they didn't fill up their neocortexes with concern about approval of their peers. And that enabled them to invent our world. Because of what they built and what was built on top of that and what was built on top of that, anyone can invent the next world by taking on seemingly crazy bets that aren't crazy. Well, such bets may fail, but as Larry Page says, there's a 100% chance of failing if you don't make those bets. The hackers, the good ones, changed our world. And if we listen to them, they can change our behavior. And then there's no limit to what we can do, including the impossible. Thanks very much. Questions for Steve? Okay. What if you could comment on bad hackers and what, what, what we might do to deal with the problem of bad hackers, governments and companies and, you know, that whole thing? Right. Well, there's different classes of bad hackers, right? So there's bad hackers with good intentions. You know, uh, there's the hacktivist camp of, 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 of hackers who feel that, you know, they're you know, doing it for a righteous cause. And often, it's, it turns out they're not. Um, but other times, <clears throat> uh, you can at least appreciate their intent. There's people who do it for gain, um, people who do it for pure destruction because they are bad people there. Um, as to what we could do to them, um, we're sort of locked into this cycle where uh, convenience is a trade-off for vulnerability. And uh, it's difficult to see how we're going to protect ourselves uh, when 
that cycle continues there. We're on this period of balance, and you know, I think that you know, drastic and maybe even unwelcome changes in our infrastructure uh, won't happen until the so-called digital Pearl Harbor or whatever Armageddon comes you know, from a horrible uh, attack uh, uh, arrives there. So I, I think that um, destructive hackers are always going to be with us to some degree. Yeah. Two questions. What do journalists, uh, what's the relationship between the, um, what's the relationship between the work of journalists and the spread of hacker ideas? And um, can you tell us anything about your interactions or insights into the work of Stuart Brand? Sure. Um, uh, happy to answer both. Um, so. You, you can't lump all journalists in together. So when I first started uh, writing about this, I was out, out on my own, and it was you know, thrilling to me to get to MIT and start talking to those people because I realized that you know, these people, this really was the source of hacker culture. Uh, the hacker culture that you see everywhere uh, really began there at, at MIT, and they knew it. You know, the Tamerk hackers then moved generally to the AI lab uh, at, at MIT, and they knew there, there was something special and something almost sacred, and they were reluctant sometimes to talk to me because they felt that, you know, it was almost like in, in cults that they felt they were stealing your soul by taking your picture, that they would give away too much uh, in, in, in speaking to me. I've always tried to be respectful to hackers and, and, and what they thought, but uh, other journalists uh, sometimes had different approaches to that, which made uh, some hackers very suspicious of it there. Um, one of my best friends is uh, the journalist John Markoff, and he wrote things about Kevin Mitnick, which a lot of people in the hacker community uh, didn't like. And you know, even though John is one of the people who's most sensitive to the good things about hackers that I was talking about here, uh, some of the people in that community you know, don't warm to him there. They don't really take much um, uh, of an attempt to see things from the journalist's point of view. So it's a mixed bag for that. As for Stuart Brand, well, I have nothing but great things to say to him. In my early days of covering the computer industry, um, I went to California a lot, and I wound up hanging out with uh, Brand's group, um, and they were doing a, a, the Whole Earth software catalog at that time. And I actually participated in that. I was the games domain editor of the Whole Earth software catalog, and I got to know Stuart, who was one of the most amazing human beings on, on earth. And I owe him a lot because my book Hackers came out. Stuart and um, Kevin Kelly, who was uh, editing the Whole Earth Review, and you know, can Stuart's camp and Stuart's wife, um, uh, Ryan Phelan, organized the first Hackers Conference. It was like a giant book party where they brought together all the generations of hackers who I wrote about in my book and, uh, for a weekend. And you know, uh, it was an, an amazing weekend, which really was helpful to me because on the way out there, I read a horrible review of, of hackers in the New York Times book review, which I thought would sink the book. But fortunately, it's been in print for over 30 years, so it really didn't kill the book. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait for the mic, please. So working at Medium, I know they have sort of an innovative organizational structure. And I was just wondering, in general, what do you think about like business organization and how that relates to right. enabling this sort of behavior you're talking about? Well, I never thought I'd get a holacracy question here. But uh, how many of you heard of holacracy? So um, this is um, a unique form of organizing a company that Tony Shea of Zappos you know, adopted, and also my boss, Ev Williams, um, at Medium, is a big fan of. And um, it's, you know, I think it has more impact, you know, to, to be honest, on the, the engineers at Medium than it does on uh, us in, in the publishing division. Though actually, you know, we're undergoing somewhat of an organization now, and you know, it, it involves a non-hierarchical way of organizing things in circles, as opposed to uh, you know a hierarchical hierarchical chart. Um, and the other thing is that when you have meetings, they're organized around resolving tensions, and they're very. Um, uh, super organized and restrained on what happens in meetings. And actually, meetings turn out to be more efficient in, you know, in this very rigid way of, of, of organizing them. Um, and so I, I like that. Um, so I'm, I'm OK with holacracy. Uh, you know, uh, but um, 
I don't know if it's made a giant difference personally for me um, in my experience at, at Medium. It's, it's kind of a curiosity, which I you know, uh, get to participate in. Yeah. As, as you get to uh, know and meet and understand these you know, great movers of the digital age, I, I wonder if you had a sense whether these people would have been great and geniuses regardless of what age they lived in or were their brains just wired for the right time at the digital age? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. The, that's, that's a great question that I've actually thought about and really haven't come up with an answer. So if, if Bill Gates were born in the Middle Ages, you know, would he have been Isaac Newton? You know, um, I think in some cases, yes. I mean, you know, uh, I, God knows what Steve Jobs would have been. Uh, you know, I mean, to me, in looking at this, you know, that's the biggest mystery of all, like how Jobs became Jobs. You know, I mean, Gates, you, you could sort of understand because he has this fantastic brain, but you understand the way it works. But Jobs, you know, it, it is just like unique, unique in that sense. And Malcolm Gladwell has this theory about special people. Uh, he calls out liars that you have to, they all spent 10,000 hours doing something, right? Um, but a lot of people spend 10,000 hours doing things, and none of them became Bill Gates. Um, I don't know what you'd spend 10,000 hours doing to become Steve Jobs, right? Uh, you know, it, 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 it's so unique. So I think that in those cases, look, if, if, if Bill Gates was born like a, a serf, he probably would have been a serf, right? There wasn't much opportunity to, you know, to, to, to rise above that, right? But if, you know, he were in like the middle class in the Renaissance, you know, maybe he would have been, you know, uh, an, an inventor, a Copernicus or something like that. With Paige pushing this idea of, just think of the unbelievable good, how are these teams organized and compensated to create this environment that Gamble away, go for it. Well, um, so Google in compensation, you know, once they really reach the peak in their stock prices, you know, um, just having options and, you know, and have seeing their stock value rise wasn't as, as big a deal. Um, uh, they have a thing called, you know, uh, Google uh, Fellows that, you know, people who do extraordinary things at Google get a substantial, you know, I think seven figure award. That's possible there. But what really keeps them going, though, is the chance to change the world, is a chance to have a huge impact. If you're a scientist and the prospect of you coming up with you know, uh, an idea that no one's done before, getting amazing resources, millions of dollars, to build it, and then having a chance to see it put in action, you can't put a price tag on that. And that's what gets those people. The challenge for Google isn't keeping those people they give those opportunities to. It's you know, keeping the people who are really super smart and they hire, and their job is you know, to just you know, do some mundane task somewhere in the organization in search or, or ads or things like that who aren't inventing the future but just keeping the system going. I, I could take one more. I don't, All right, sure. Okay. Um, you were just talking about the opportunities of a surf, and um, I've been thinking about um, women in computing. I wonder if you're, if the, you haven't mentioned any uh, fantastic women hackers. I saw some in the Google picture, but I don't know if you can name any or if you see more uh, fabulous women up and coming. Um, well, I, 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 I think one great thing that's happening, and really this is in the last year, is it's really getting to the top of the stack to make this, to understand how big a problem this is um, and how women have been discouraged from pursuing you know, a, a field which you know, the women are just as capable as, as, as men. And I, you know, uh, uh, to, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, I, I mentioned Marissa in there, who's you know, a, an exceptional person, um, but you know, uh, if you look at the Pantheon, it is sadly overly male. Um, there are great and women hackers, women you know uh, achievers. I'm thinking of people like Mary Lou Jepsen and you know um, you know uh, and you know a lot of founders of, uh, of companies now we're, we're we're seeing like thank God are are also women. Um, Medium as as one company has tried hard to get some you know gender diversity in the engineering staff. But it's a hard, hard task that people finally 
are taking seriously, and it's not going to change overnight, but I really hope it does change um, you know, as, as quickly as possible because you know, the field needs all the great people it can get, and a lot of those great people uh, should be women. I enjoyed reading your book, Hackers, uh, but brought me up to the from the beginning of hacking through about 1984. Pardon? I think it's the history up through about 1984. Right. And it was in 1985, I think, that an organization called MacHack began. It's changed its name over the years. Did that lead to any innovations? Did hacking become a, a, a positive force? Well, I think it did. I mean, I think that. Look, you know, so I, I mentioned you know, before now, you know, there is this phenomena of the hackathon. Um, the maker movement is a direct descendant of the hackers, uh, the, ha the hacker movement, and you know, it sort of blends in. The, the hacker spaces are part of the maker movement, right? Um, and I think that those lessons now of the hackers are getting widespread circulation there. And people talk about hacking, not just about technology now. They talk about hacking government and hacking other things in a, in a positive sense, life hacking. Um, so I think those, you know, uh, that mentality is spreading in a positive way and not only just in terms of innovation but in terms of, you know, open systems and, and, and sharing. So, you know, uh, I think that it's, it's a belated thing and the negative connotation of the word from bad actors slow things down for a long time, but now people are really embracing it. So the hacker ethic is alive. I definitely think so. As a matter of fact, it's kind of funny because when I finished my book, I was somewhat pessimistic about it. It ended with Richard Stallman, who um, you know, was struggling at that point. Uh, and you know, I saw him this is sort of like the last of the Mohicans sitting there living in like on the roof of you know like a, the, the fake roof of a, uh, an office in Tech Square, um, you know, fighting the a, a battle that looked like he would lose. Um, but you know, because it turned out, you know, what a legacy he has to you know in, invent. I'm, I'm not even sure what his politically correct way of, of putting it is, but I'll call it the open source movement. <laughs> of the last question. So I, I wonder if in talking to all these people and surveying so many advances. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So uh, without building up, I'm kind of curious is where you see education in the sort of spectrum of intelligences that you've seen. You know, what if you've ever thought about what kinds of education actually, you know, make, you know, create, help create these people? I mean, many of these people, like, you know, I mean, some of them left high school, right? Some right. of them left in the middle of college. Others finished college. Others got graduate degrees. And so there's a whole range of sort of influence, if you like, from the academy. I wonder right. if you could say anything about that. Well, you'll notice that, you know, I, you know we, we, had, we, we started with Dartmouth and MIT, right? So you have to say a lot springs from, from, from those centers. Um, you know, uh, Gates and Zuckerberg dropped out of Harvard. But I think the fact that they didn't complete college education made them more voracious readers and uh, believers in education. Um, you know, Gates spends more money than anyone funding education. And Mark Zuckerberg's given $100 million to New York schools. And he's you know, involved in these schools in East Palo Alto. He teach, he's been teaching a class there uh, for the last year, or last year he did. Um, so I think that... You know, uh, even hackers who have managed success from not going far in formal education, you know, uh, appreciate how educational institutions are an important source of innovation. Um, you know, you can't separate Google from Stanford, right? It's almost the same in, in institution there, and you know, the you know the the little uh, the well-beaten footbridge from Stanford to the Google campus, you know, is, is evidence of that. So I think that it, the, you know, the, the two, you know, edu higher education and that movement are inexorably linked there. So um, it's a connection that it's unimaginable um, to, you know, uh, you can't imagine it without it, let me put it that way. Okay, well, Stephen, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.